Hi, I'm Anumita and I'm at the TCS Innovation Forum 2017 at Institute of Engineering and Technology. I'm right in front of the Engineering Ideas Wall where they have showcased the 100 best ideas of the world. Uh, we are just about to begin the utilities uh, breakout session. In fact, we are about to start our panel around the convergence of uh, industries. Is it a threat or an opportunity for utilities? We're fortunate to have amongst us panelists from the utility sector, from the telecom sector, as well as from the media sector. So let's go and have a look at our panel. So the topic, convergence of industries. Is it a threat or opportunity for utilities? Um, I've asked the, the panelists to start, and I'm going to introduce each of them individually. I've asked them to start with a very quick comment, and then we're going to have a conversation. And the quick comment, the question I challenge them to, to tell me, and I think, Simone, we're going to start with you. Simone Torino, um, Business Application Manager at UKPN. He's standing in very bravely and very much the last minute for Matt uh, Webb. Um, two things. One thing, what excites you about convergence, and what alarms you or worries you about it? I've been thinking about this. Uh, hello, everyone, by the way. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this like throughout the day, actually, really. And uh, I think that what excites me about conversion is convergence. And that's exactly the same thing that threatens me as well. OK. Uh, meaning that I think is like the fact that we have convergence, which can mean a number of different things as well, is, uh, is surely what makes exciting the uh, utilities uh, right now, because as, as we've seen today, things are changing. We're starting like, to see new technologies coming in, which have been followed by regulation, by different customer behaviors, and everything comes together in a different way than it used to be before. Uh, at the same time, though, that, that is exactly what is uh, potentially very difficult to manage. Mm. So there needs to be also a clarity uh, across the different industries which are converging together in terms of trying to picture a vision where we can get an agreement on where are we going. And, and, and there is a number of those elements uh, as well that I think that can overlap. Brilliant. Uh, Thanks very much. Yeah. Russell. Russell Morris, head of IT at Northern Power Grid. What what's excites you about it? What alarms you? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I think probably the thing that um, most excites me is the, the whole convergence, the smart agenda. We're getting smart meters, smart fridges, the Internet of Things, the whole ability to kind of leverage something new. And as, a, as an old-fashioned utility, really, a regulated utility, it's hard to find new sources um, of revenue generation, and I think that that kind of uh, excites me as a, a new way to, to generate revenue. I think on the, the flip side, the thing that keeps me awake at night, the thing that's got me, got me worried, is, is more around the cyber security agenda. So as somebody that's responsible for the IT network, the OT network, it's way easier to manage a dumb grid um, and that's what we've kind of had for the last 20 years. You need to send a man to a substation to flick a switch to get the power back on. That's easy to manage. You know where he is, you know what buttons he's pressing. As soon as you kind of uh, add ones and noughts to that, you make it binary, um, you've got a whole different challenge. So um, I think that that's the thing that will uh, kind of get my attention for a while. Brilliant, thanks. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Uh, Richard next. Richard Hepworth, who is Digital Transformation Director uh, for Utilities at PwC. What's your plus what or minus? What excites me? So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Hepworth. Um, what really excites me is I think this uh, connected home, the data, the technology, and the applications really allows us to do transformative uh, customer propositions and get properly customer centric. So, uh, and that's not just about allowing our customers to engage, it's also giving access to our people for them to service the customers better in a much more intimate way. So, that really excites me. I think what concerns me is that I don't think we necessarily understand our role within the new emerging value chain. I think the traditional values are going to be the margins decreasing. I think there'll be a new emerging values adjacent to our immediate market, which will be the main drivers for the consumer. And it suddenly struck me halfway through this event that actually maybe the bigger uh, event is happening around us in the other rooms as opposed to the room in here. So there could be something happening around transportation or healthcare that actually will have a bigger impact on us and actually we're not in that conversation right now. So that always concerns me and I'm not in the right place. So just that you're missing out, fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. <laughs> it's somewhere else, guys. We're looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> OK, great. Um, Andreas now. Andreas Manolis, who is Group Head of Strategy and Risk. Um, uh, BT, um, uh, Group uh, Revenue Assurance, and who also stood in uh, really at the last minute for, for Benice DiMarco. 
What's your plus and minus? So, um, Richard, I, I wish I went before you. So I, I had a, a very uh, a similar theme. Transformation is, is, is key here. But it's the ability to create the right business case within the organization to transform. Because now's the time to do it. Because everyone's saying all new things are coming in. The world is changing in telecoms. We've got IoT, we've got NFV, all the buzzwords are there. And we've got to change and transform with time. So actually, um, as previous speakers have spoken, it's an opportunity to reinvent yourself. So that really excites me and that driver. In terms of the concern, I'll go back to Richard. Assuring the business and assuring the wider business, that value chain is getting exponential to get to the customer. You consider a third party, then you consider third parties of third parties. Continue on and you know what happens in that chain. You know, from three to nine to 27, seven to nine, I can do my maths, <laughs> almost 20,000 uh, different connected parties there to d deliver a service. So uh, for me is how do we assure that and how do we make sure the margins are there that we originally said they were? And one thing on top is that agility. So in the offering, who controls the offering to the customer? So when you've, when you've connected that customer and you've allowed other companies to actually offer that service and then change that service on the customer's behalf, how do you make sure you can control that mechanism, assuring your charging properly and in reverse, assuring the right quality of service is being given? So in, some, in terms of agility, you mean a kind of speed of response as well? It's not just who controls it, it's how you can change it quickly? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a very quick question. Um, what, what, did anybody recognise, so hands up if you recognise any of those things that the, the different panellists were excited by? Yep. Hands up if you recognise the things that they were alarmed by. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Was anyone was anyone thinking? Well, actually, I'm alarmed by something else, or I'm excited by something else. What was it? Uh, There's a microphone right next to you. Uh, sorry, with um, with all of the change that we've talked about, the thing that's coming across is all customers are the same, and I actually wonder what's going to happen to the customers that can't afford or are less able than some of the customers that, look at, that are looking at this exciting technology and um, what will the politicians and the regulators do about that? Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Can I just, Go sorry, because I think that's such an important point actually, mm. I dare I say I'm building it. Um, but I think as an industry we've been very lazy about treating customers very homogenous. We talk about uh, residential customers or INC or SME customers. And if you look at all those emerging models, we're going to have to get ever more sophisticated about our consumers. It's no longer going to be one residential customer. There's one with an EV, one with a battery. Businesses are going to have micro smart grids. Some businesses will be completely, totally off grid. I think the marketing challenge, the way we look at our consumers, are going to be increasingly more, more sophisticated. And that includes the vulnerability. And we do need to have a story about vulnerability. After saying that, with vulnerability, some of the new propositions could be around the healthcare example that EDF demonstrated, as opposed to other things. So because we're locking into different value pools, I think the solutions may look slightly differently. And you, you'd be surprised. I think the accessibility may be easier when you came from a healthcare perspective than a, that pure energy perspective. Brilliant, thanks. So uh, our final panelist, um, Philip Clayson, Technology Director of Talk Talk. What excites you and what frightens you? I hope we haven't already covered it. No, uh, well, you've touched on it, I think, in, in part. So um, customers is, is pretty much at the heart of what TalkTalk Talk tries to do. For those of you that know the industry, you'll know we had a cyber attack about 18 months ago. Um, and we've learned more from that, I think, than we've probably learned in the 10 years prior uh, about how customers think. Um, in terms of excitement, I think the, the thing that um, Convergence brings, and, and we're seeing it as we, we position ourselves as a digital utility, not just a, a telco, um, is, is that there's a, there's a lot more choice for the customer out there. They can do a lot more. Uh, a lot more choice, a lot more flexibility, um, but they will, to Richard's point, I think they could become confused as well. Um, in terms of what concerns us, it's the, it's the level of uh, the level of trust they have. When we had the cyber attack uh, a year ago, we did a survey within a few days of being attacked, and we did it every fortnight for about six months after that. And actually, they didn't trust us or the industry, in fact, any more or less as we went through that six-month period, which we found actually quite quite fascinating. So. If you take that as a baseline and then you extend it out to the other rooms that are running in parallel around the, around the building, 
do they trust us any more or less as telco or energy or healthcare or anything else? It's a, it's a hard one to crack. Well, so so what the conclusion that you draw from the fact that the trust didn't change is that they don't trust anybody? That, that's the extrapolation of what we learned in that period of time. Everyone's okay. as good or as bad as each other. Yeah. So there could be comfort in that, right? If they don't trust anybody, then you can do anything, right? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> how do you set yourself apart? How do you, how do you then become yeah. that little, the, you know, just noses yeah. out in front? That's the challenge. So there, is then, another, there is another aspect to that as well. So one part is like, do the customer trust or understand what they see and what are we doing from the utilities to actually provide them with the information that they need to actually understand what's the art of possible. And I think that's, that's going to be vital for this confused customer that is seeing all of these different bits and pieces coming from a number of different sectors mm -hmm. to actually have almost a journey, and effectively there is a lot to talk about like customer journeys, digital customer journey and all of mm -hmm. that, to actually understand what it means in a daily life for them, actually adopting or not specific solutions. And I think that's, that's something that probably, uh, as, as, as in, like in, in the utility industry, utilities can probably learn to do better than before. I think it, probably everyone can learn to do better, and perhaps particularly this is something that's, that's coming up now with utilities. So well, you just said, uh, um, Philip, that partly it's how can, how can you then get the competitive advantage. Obviously, if you can really win the trust of your customers when they don't trust anybody else, then you put yourself in a position of competitive advantage. There is a flip side to that, which is that uh, there, there is a sense, I think, in this sector, and probably in most sectors, but particularly this one, that reputation is a, is a global commons. That the, the flip side will apply, that if they don't trust anybody, no matter what you do, they won't trust you if someone else does something bad. And so part of it is not just how do you get that competitive advantage, but how do you build trust for the whole industry, right? We spoke to a, a number of our customers actually, you know, for actual feedback as opposed to just a survey at that at the time of the cyber attack, and the feedback, the general feedback from those that felt they had the ability to comment. Uh, and this is not expert industry people; these are general customers that buy broadband from us. Was well, if it hadn't been you, it would have been somebody else. You were just either unlucky or careless, or perhaps both. But there was mm. no particular malice against talk talk in the most part. Um, they just it's just part of the times we live in. I think we've seen in the 18 months since just how many big brands have gone through what we so went through, and so. you know, yeah. So I think I'd like to come back to trust if I can. But first of all, uh, just on the, on the subject of cybersecurity, because it you know it occurred to me when we were hearing all those excited things about connected homes, that that we haven't really talked so very much about part of the lack of trust is might be, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't trust your motives, but part of it might be. I, I don't want my my private and personal, most private and personal space to be potentially invaded. I, you know, I lock the doors, but what if what if people can come in regardless? So, uh, this is I know something that's that's on your mind. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, when you talk to people about like the smart metering agenda and, and getting smart technology, but a certain generation kind of worries about that. And as a utility, a regulated utility, we, we'd like to get as much insight as we can onto the low voltage part of the grid. I think we've got really good insight on the HV, the high voltage side, but on the low voltage side, it's a bit hard to know. So if somebody has a power cut in their house now, we have to wait for them to ring up before we know that they've got it. The smart meter and the data that that generates provides us a fantastic insight that we didn't have. But it's also, we've seen in um, some US studies, um, I, I should have probably said that our, my company's owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, and we've got a massive um, Berkshire Hathaway energy uh, in the US, and they've done some micro studies with um, uh, people looking at data and how they feel about it. And there's actually been some cases where people have been able to hack into the smart meter data to be able to know when someone's home or not. So we can see what the energy usage is, we know that they're not there, so we'll go and rob the house. And that type of thing turns into urban legend and folklore that, that never let the truth get in the way of a good story type of dynamic where people start to worry, what's happening with my data? Who's really listening when I say, um, hello, Google? Is it listening the whole time? Is it recording my entire conversation? I don't want that in my house. And people are starting to get more aware of that. And as a, as a, as a business, we have a social responsibility to treat that data very carefully. So where do we put it? How, how is it encrypted? Um, GDPR and, and all the legislations and the fines that come with it, we're really at risk if we get that wrong. So it's our reputation on the line, um, but we want that data to try and make our business better, I think. 
So how do you get that balance? Has any, anyone else got any thoughts about that? Because it really is, if the data are out there, then, I mean, you just said that if it hadn't happened to us, everyone thought it would happen to someone else, and it clearly has over the past 18 months. Yeah, I, well, I think it, it's the way you, it was talked about before. So what we, we've put a, a data VIP within our own function. So our function is 400 people out of 100,000. So, um, but we're driving our own uh, data VIP uh, strategy from the business into technology. So what was discussed b before is when you're moving to big data, you've gotta, you can't move and be agile uh, because you have to sacrifice something and that sacrifice is security. I say it isn't. Actually, if you plan ahead, you can drive consolidated data source into a big data lake. No longer do you have multiple different databases. I mean, how many people out there have 20 databases they're trying to connect to? You can put it into a single hub, work with your IT teams effectively to deliver an effective solution around the data, and then you can cluster your applications around it. So it's a different thinking. Mm. And also then, you have the agility. Because once you have that data in one place, and we're, 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 uh, I'm pushing forward for this view of um, data is so important and going forward, because we make all our business decisions from these data sources. Mm -hmm. So bad data can lead to bad decisions. So if you can assure that data lake, and then coming from an assurance function, I'm quite passionate about it, and you can give quality assurance to the business, and you've secured that full layer, then actually potentially utopia, right? You've got what you need and off you go. But the challenge is I think consumers are starting to say, hey, what do you know about me? Yeah. Where are you keeping it? And what are you doing to keep it safe? Sure. And, and, and how do I, and how do I trust get, what you yeah, yeah. And, and they have rights and powers to ask you to provide integrity in reports. And, and I, I, I see that that's, that trend is, is moving up. People are much more self-aware when you see the stuff like the talk talk thing or countless other companies that have got hacked and data has been stolen, you think, gee, I, what, what's happening to my data? Where are you keeping it? This is important to me. It's kind of like my, my children, how are you caring <laughs> for them? And, and they, they get more, much more passionate than they ever used to. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's Richard, what I'm saying. Hang on, sorry, Richard's been uh, trying to jump in. I, I, I was just <laughs> slightly building that one point. I mean, I, I think we should embrace GDPR because you have a right to auto forget. And actually, all the behavior data or the device data is personal data, and we should treat it as such. And so one, my one build is that we, we have to look at data and be very transparent on how we're going to use consumer data, and that's part of our contract. In the same way you ask for money, you provide a service. You ask for data, you provide a service. And therefore, putting the customer at the center of that and giving them the auto-delete, the right to forget button from the start is incredibly important. If you get that foundation right, then, then actually that trust will build because you're being very transparent on how you're doing it. Unfortunately, I think we've used data inappropriately as sectors and industries for too long, and consumers are getting very aware of that. So transparency of data usage is going to be critical in propositional design. I think that sounds really important. So we've gone actually from, are the data safe because someone might steal it, to uh, could, could, we, could we be misusing it and could people perceive us as being misusing it? And and I, I would on. like to add one thing on that mm -hmm. as well which the way that we're actually utilizing the data and translate data and information are changing. So now we're talking about AI, we are talking about a lot of like type of different analytics, uh, predictive things, sentiment analysis, behavioral uh, science and all of that. Um, can we actually give the customer visibility of that? Because the trust is, yes, we need to ensure that we are treating the data right. We need to ensure that we give the customer the ability of uh, choosing whether to remove their own records uh, from from uh, from the data stores that we've got, but it's also about if we're doing something with that data, we're combining those data. Can we give that that visibility to the customer? Sure. Uh, so yeah, there's sure. like one more bit to it, I think. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's almost so one step. First of all, can the data be stolen? Next, can, or, or are we misusing it? And then the third part, I would say, comes up with the, the question that I asked earlier, which is the relationship with the customer rather than the transactions. And so I'd, I'd wanted to ask you this as well, because in this, in this spirit of convergence, one of the things that happens there is that you don't have a company that controls and that delivers. Mm -hmm. You have a much more complicated ecosystem. And within that, it could either, I think there's almost a choice. It's like I, I see it as train points. It could go much more transactional, or, or you could actually start to build relationships. And which do you think is more desirable and which do you think is the direction we're going in? Anybody? To build, though, it's interesting to the point about differentiation. To, to build the relationships, if you're using data to inform, 
then you've got to you've got to have a, a good profile of, of, a, of a customer. If you are if they self if they choose to self delete, then you know that profile's lost, mm. and with that potentially goes some loyalty, and with that go mm. it becomes churn, and then it all becomes a, a much more quantitized market, and you don't get that differentiation because you don't get the loyalty. You can't mm -hmm. you can't keep them sticky as as is sometimes we use as a term in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. They drift away, and then, then it, you know you don't get the value. The value is not found. Sure. What is any real challenge to you know keep as much data as you can and, and find a way of building value on. But they're more likely on. to keep the data with you if they trust you, so it Correct. becomes a yeah. a circle. It is. Yeah. So uh, so uh, another sorry, uh, I think we sometimes kill ourselves that we have relationships with our customers. If I'm really candid, I think customers are very transactional. Relationship is slightly de deeper, uh, and it sort of revolves around the, the trust agenda as well. The, the point I'd like to raise is. Um, the data we use, making our people have access to the data to better service the consumer is really important and being transparent on how you use that data. So, you know, there is already situations whereby the consumer knows more about their energy profile than the call centre agent receiving a call. And as a consumer, if I've got a relationship with you, I expect you to know me better mm. than that. So I actually think trust and brand, it's all about that personal interaction and putting that person into the relationship and having the empathy of the person on the phone. So therefore, we have got to be much better at getting our people access to this data to better service the more complex inquiries that are going to arise from these new technologies. Mm -hmm. And that has to be whether it's on the call centre or actually is it's face to face. Because, you know, they may not trust the brand, but I know lots of people who trust that service engineer who comes through their threshold to fix their boiler. Mm. And that's the difference. And therefore, if we want to get trust back onto the agenda, it's a people imperative and giving your people the insight and the information as opposed to just branding and marketing. Absolutely. And I, I was just about to say, in fact, uh, it was only a few months ago I was talking to the chairman of a large energy company who said exactly that thing. They don't trust energy companies, but they trust the engineer who comes through the door. And that's the, that's the place to, to build on. Um, any other comments on that? Yeah, I would say again, your 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 privacy privacy policy and privacy filters. You know, I, I believe again, once if you can create this kind of centralized solution where you apply the right privacy yeah. filters first, the risk of then impacting privacy settings that you've got across your whole um, base actually reduces because yeah. you're trying to actually empower the users after you've applied that. There are different rules to, to, to different uh, settings and, and different consumers. So sure. you, you need to apply effectively. Yeah. So just uh, in the last few minutes that we have, I, I'd just like to take it uh, away from customers now and on to uh, other businesses. So um, in, in this convergence space, it's not just about a relationship with customers or changing relationship. It's also about working with different ecosystems and different companies. And Simone, you said right at the beginning that that, that was one of the things that you found uh, um, alarming in a way, uh, as well as exciting, that the importance of having a collective vision, you said. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely important. So like a specific example like for, for like distribution network operators that are moving into the space of system operators effectively is that... Uh, there are going to be other markets that are going to be generated by, 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 by the adoption of all these new technologies. So there is a lot of, and, and, and this has been done, but also like a European level, there has been like a, a conversation in terms of, um, of how the different distribution, distribution network operators position themselves within, within this ever-changing landscape, right? And there might be different solutions, so I, I, I don't know what the, the, the effective uh, structure of the market will, will look like, but we do have uh, a fundamental role in terms of understanding how we relate, for example, with someone that is increasingly providing photovoltaic rather than uh, new vendors or electric vehicles, or even other governmental organizations or other industries such as transportation that are must start adopting these technologies in a different ways. Uh, a very easy example of, of, of relationship would be, for, for example, if, if transport switched to electric vehicles overnight, What's, that, what's going to happen then to the provision of, mm. of, of electricity? Do, do we have, in terms of, from a system perspective, as a network, enough capacity, enough capability to actually be able to, 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 to support that, that switch in, in, the, in, the, in the behavior and the adoption of that specific mm -hmm. technology? And the same can be, can be done with a number of other techs. So the re building relationship among the different actors mm. is, 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 is fundamental to be able to manage it over time. And that was what scares me, because if it really happens overnight, I'm not sure whether we would be able from 
a distribution network side of things to actually support that. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but it might happen sooner than many people think. And I think this is your comment about but not being in the right room with the right conversations. Yeah. What, can, what can we do to, to help to build those relationships so that we can be having the right conversations? It's, it's an, it feels like an unnatural way of thinking. Who, who would you even reach out to and how? But, but what do you guys think? So, uh, I've done some, uh, a lot of work around connected home. There's two things. Well, I think we need to be present uh, in that. Um, I did some research, did a press release about Connected Home, and I got called by the energy companies, the retailers, the telcos, the insurance companies, the pension offerers, so at, at the healthcare providers. And so, you know, there's, there's a little bit about being very clear on which proposition you want to be going after and making sure that within your, your, if you like, your business strategy there, I say that you understand the total addressable market and make sure you understand what needs to be brought into your proposition to actually answer that end solution. I, I then think we also need to be, um, we did about three or four scenarios similar to what, you know, um, TCS has done on, on, the, on the energy scheme. Uh, and the energy, the, the vehicle mobility virtual power station uh, module, that, that's probably one I've spoken the most about in my client conversations recently because of the urban pollution in London, mm. and actually people now are becoming very worried, and actually it's less about cost saving and some of the environmental stuff that we generally mm. talk about as, as an organization of type use tariffs. We're talking about electric vehicles yeah. because they need to support the urban environment in here. So I, I think we have to be very aware about all those ecosystems and make sure that we're participating, and it's gonna get a lot more complex than uh, it currently is today. Yeah. Which, are, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look yeah, at it. Uh, we have about three more minutes. So in that three minutes, very quick last comment from each of you. Is there one particular takeaway that you got from today that uh, you'd like to mention? Anyone want to start? I think Richard's point around mixing, you know, being across all the agendas, not, not just a, a utilities agenda, is fundamental. Great. It's all part of one big system. That's an interesting thought for me to take away. Sure. Anyone else? Um, I think interesting that we're, we've all there's all there's been a very similar theme in all the presentations. I think we're all suffering from the same challenge, the same issues. Um, it'll be interesting to see how we evolve as a kind of B two B community to actually come together to solve them. Um, I, there hasn't been a lot of that really coming together, and until we do that, um, we can't really get that consumer happy and confident that we're working together cohesively to help them. Um, so. I think that's pretty interesting. Sure. I'll expand on it, but I don't think we've got time. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that for me, it's, it's a bit of both, meaning that definitely the B2B and the, like, the old value chain is, is something that we've got cross-industry to try and have as much visibility of as possible. And the other bit, I, I think actually building on what you, you, you mentioned in, uh, in your panel earlier, um, is about really the three levels of like regulation, technology, and, and culture. And I think that convergence is, is not only on the value chain, but it's also across those three different layers. So there is going to be like a feedback in between what the regulators do, what the technology does, and what the, the, the culture of the consumers will be and how it will change. So I, I'll take that away. Sure, think, thanks. From today. Richard? Um, I think one of the things that I, I, I'll take away is I think that we, we have to be prepared to fail. I'm going to say that in a very strange way. There's a lot of tests to learn and lots of innovation needed. And I don't think we'll necessarily get it right first time. And I think what we need to do is be very adapt in actually doing something, scaling it, learning it, and then either scaling it more or, or parking it at that stage. So I think we need to be a bit more risky. Uh, I think we need to get out in the marketplace and, and start the conversation with customers. Great. Okay. Andreas? Yeah, so it's, it's a similar thing about that agility. So we need to do it but have customer privacy at the front of what we do. And I think we're privileged to be able to do that in a way as, as our industries, we have the right, we already have the, the margins and to be able to know that we protect the customers, right? Everyone says in our industry, we're slow. We're actually slow for a reason because we think about protecting mm. truly, it is truly about protecting our customers and what we do whilst in the non-regulated areas like the internet companies and stuff, you see what's going on, yeah. how fast they're turning around. And then you get all the different issues. Well, they've used that, that data for this, they've used that data for us. So there's, um, I think, kind of the, um, the hare and the tortoise kind of scenario comes in, but we will get there. We are getting there. I think we're, we're expanding our pace, but we're doing it with uh, that, uh, you know, that good sense 
of that final customer in mind, our own customers, I think, and how we work together in the industry to provide an end-to-end -end solution. I think that's the way, because you talk about trust. Yeah. How do we do that? We have to do that ethically. That's a very fine note to end on, mm -hmm. exactly at the 30-minute mark. Thank you very much. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you, all of you.